begin. This is chapter 12. Uh, the title or subtitle is Advection. And what is Advection, you may wonder? I wonder that too. Turns out it has many meanings depending on which field you're in. <laughs> in the weather community, Advection is what happens when air goes side to side and convection is what happens when it goes up and down. I did not know that. But uh, this is this is how things are. Uh, I think it's interesting. This book seems to use terminology I've never seen before, despite having been exposed to partial differential equations before many times. But I mean, it's a mathematics perspective versus a uh, engineering perspective, I guess one way to say it. Oops, I don't need this. Can you see my screen? Yes. Okay, good. I believe you can. Not up and down vigorously or something. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> yeah, we can see. <laughs> so uh, the first example he gives for what, so advection basically means like flow. It's like, uh, it's a flow of material before we do diffusion where things kind of like, you know, dampen out and they just disappear. Now we're talking about things just moving along and flowing. And that's that's basically what he means. Advection is just the, uh, not diffusion in some ways. So his first example he gives is this traffic flow problem and in this case, we have two functions of uh, space and time. One is the flux, which is uh, along a road, the number of cars passing at a given point as a point in time as a function of a, uh, uh, sorry, number of cars passing at a given point on the road space as a function uh, per unit time, per unit time, right? So uh, that sounds like a lot of words, but just like, you know, oh, the traffic's light, there's six cars going by every minute or something like that, right? That's the flux. The density is how packed it is on the road in terms of cars per unit length. So uh, if there's like, you know, one car per mile, that's pretty low density. If there's 100 cars per you know mile, that's a little higher density type thing. And he proposes a model for uh, how the flux varies as a function of density, because as you know, when the road gets crowded, uh, we all have to slow down. But initially, as the road gets cr crowded, crowded, even though we're slowing down, there's more cars going by a given point in time. So the actual flux is increasing, even though it's getting slower for any individual driver, the number of cars getting by that point in time continues to increase up to a point, which he calls the uh, maximum density. At that point, things have started to reach a point where now as more and more, the density goes higher and higher. Now, the not only is everybody going slower, but actually it's going so much slower that the cars per unit time passing given point is going down. Until finally, that's, that happens at the uh, density row M, and then uh, at that point, you reach flux QM, the maximum flux. And then as the density increases even further, at some point, you reach a critical density where it's a traffic jam. Nobody can move at all, right? So that's the, the kind of simple model of flux as a function of density. He calls it capital Q zero here because he's saying, well, the actual flux is not quite that. It's going to be modified a little bit by the fact that people have a... Uh, Ch a chance to react to the increasing or decreasing density. And that causes this little epsilon rho x term term here, which we'll see later actually turns into a diffusion type term, which calms the, the model down a little bit, as it were. So to get some kind of differential equation out of this, we apply uh, the equation of conservation of cars, as it were, which simply states that, uh, a, that at a given, well, here I wrote it as a little equation, right? So uh, if you take rows of T, the density per unit uh, uh, time, and multiply it by uh, the, 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 uh, some particular finite, consider some like little finite length on the row of delta X, right? Inside that, there's going to be some number of cars, rows of T times delta X, that's the number of cars inside that, like let's say 100 yards or something like that, right? Um, now that density is going to decrease, but it only can decrease by cars coming in and cars going out. And that's what the other side of the equation is. Uh, the derivative of Q, the uh, flux, right, is going to be equal to the flux coming in on one side and the flux going out the other side. And that's all that, this is all this equation says in uh, in words, in a lot of words, probably too many words, but you get the idea, right? The standard conservation law for a differential equation like this. Okay, now we've introduced this kind of motivating equation, but this is not where we're going to start out. We're going to start with something simpler, um, something called the advection equation. This is, he calls the advection equation. So it's the simplest possible equation you can have to describe the transport of a quantity uh, U of X and T at some constant speed C. Uh, it's just a partial differential of U with respect to T plus C times a partial derivative of U with respect to X is equal to zero. And the solution for this is any function of X and T um, 
or you just, or I should say it another way. If the initial condition is some function u of x and zero, then the solution for all time is u of x minus ct uh, is zero, right? So it's just, you can see that a simple substitution, all it is just a lump of matter moving, uh, or a lump of uh, something moving at a constant speed, unchanged shape or, or anything. And you can see that by just simply substitute that in. So, well, we do numerical analysis here. So let's um, try. Oh, let me just, before I go into this thing more deeply, I, I wanted to say that I think this is a short enough chapter. I might be able to finish it today if I can, but I'm not going to try to rush through it other than my normal tendency to probably talk too fast. But if there's something that I'm going through that you don't, uh, that you want to discuss further, I was going to say that you want to ask me about, but I probably, this is my understanding is, maybe, is not that deep or well to mind, but we can all discuss anything that you guys uh, found in the chapter while you're reading it uh, that I just kind of cruise right past perhaps. Any event, we're going to use the same methods that Andrew covered in chapter 11, this method of lines. So we, we discretize the space part separately than the time part. And we basically turn our differential partial differential equation into a system of uh, ordinary differential equations by using these uh, difference matrix. So this is the one, for example, a second order difference matrix for periodic boundary conditions. So the operator automatically respects periodic uh, boundary conditions. And we just use that function we defined last time. Just to remind you what this does, it takes the space dimension, divides up in this case, 300 points on um, the space, uh, span x span is goes from minus four to four in this particular setup from the book right it's a demo from the book <clears throat> and the equation differential equation is just simply uh you can just put it in there right the uh, the left hand side this is a parameter c and t and it's just equal to what the equation actually says we just put it out in uh, explicit form as a matrix equation starts out with some uh bump this is a gaussian bump um it doesn't perfectly respect the periodic boundary conditions, but within numerical error, it's fine. It's well contained within the interval. And then we just solve it using the ordinary differential, ordinary, <laughs> the regular ODE problem solver. Um, and here he uses RK4, and I'm not gonna make any comments about that, but in any event, you can solve it and then you can animate it. And sure enough, it works. It's a lump that moves along constant speed like this little video demonstrates. Um, and it's periodic boundary conditions, so it goes out one side and comes back in the other, as you would expect. So why do we do that? We just did that to demonstrate that we can solve these things numerically. We already know the solution to this thing because it got an easy analytical solution. But the traffic, pro, uh, traffic flow problem is a different kind of thing altogether. We don't have an analytic solution for this, but we can use the exact same setup. We just put in this, this, this so he just defines uh, this derivative because we need the derivative of Q0 for this. Uh, so he worked it out analytically, apparently, and I, I didn't check his work, so I just copied this directly out of the textbook. <laughs> I assume it's right. Um, and plug it into the same solver, and now you get more interesting results. So this is kind of interesting. This represents, um, so x along is the position along the road. What are we looking at here? We're looking at a traffic jam flowing back through uh, along the road. It's like a wave of traffic. So traffic is bunched up somewhere further down the road, then it kind of loosens up as people go forward, then the congestion moves back down the road. And this is something that is, that is seen in real life. Um, if the traffic is even more congested, you end up with this kind of shock wave um, that moves, that like hits like a cliff where everybody just kind of stops uh, and then they can then it can, you can kind of go on. And eventually it diffuses out because we put some diffusion thing in there, um, which is representative of real life that people do have some time to react. Now, that's kind of cool. Uh, so there's an exercise that asks us to estimate how fast is this bump moving backward in in, in, along the road. Um, so I attempted that exercise here. So I use I, I played around a little bit. They asked, they said, oh, what do they say? They say, okay, using as large a discretization as a small dissipation parameter, just say dissipation parameters at epsilon, uh, partial derivative of the density respect X that we put in there to help dissipate the traffic. Uh, you can get away with perform experiments to estimate the speed of the shock wave uh, between t equals 0.11 and t equals 0.15. So let me give you a hint, use argmax. Okay. And they also say that the theory predicts that the speed of the shock wave is the average of the derivative of q0 evaluated at the top of the and the bottom of the shock wave. So I try to do both these things together. <clears throat> so again, I define this reason this is 600 because I just played around with a bunch of different values and I don't know, that seemed to produce a good 
smooth uh, estimation, as I'll show you in a second. The rest of this is actually just copied directly from above. All of this is. And uh, the only thing different is here, when I get the solution, I'm now going to plot uh, the traffic shock wave at 10 different points between 0 0.11 well, one, one and 1.5. One I wanted 10 points, so that's why it's probably some nicer way to express this. <laughs> this is what I did. 22 to 30 divided by 200. That worked for me. Um, so I just built up a, uh, a vector of the maximum estimate of the maximum position and also this theoretical value. And I may not have understood how this was supposed to be calculated, but I took the, um, the maximum, uh, get off there. I calculated the uh, maximum using argmax of the solution and stored that uh, the position that it was at at that argmax into xmax. And I also calculated um, from that. I just realized that I do see why I made a mistake. Now I know why I probably got the wrong answer. Anyway, I'm trying to calculate here the, the value of uh, dq0 at the maximum as well. And taking the average of that and the average at the bottom, well, the bottom is just 400 because everywhere 400, that's the, the initial condition. Like see here, two is 400, and it goes up to like 480 here, uh, the car density. But I realize now that this is not car density, so I, that's the wrong thing to put in there. So now I know why I don't get the right answer, so I have to fix that later. But. It always comes when you try to explain to someone else what you're doing, they realize what your mistake is. <laughs> <It's not laughs> anyway, that's what this does. And I just plot out the, just so you can see the point moving along, boop, 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 boop. And then we can plot the positions and the maximums as they go, as time goes along, the, the thing flows backwards, moves backwards, right? And I just fit a line to just using the, the, the simplest possible way to fit a line, right? Um, can make a little uh, vendor mod, not vendor mod, uh, the, well, yeah, simplest possible vendor mod matrix, dividing it uh, by the maximums and calculating the slope, and I get 4.26 units uh, per unit, right? <laughs> unit distance per unit time of backward travel. And this, you know, the points are consistent with that. And now I realize this, this theory thing's off, but now I think I know what the problem is. So I think you ignore that to go back and redo that problem. But I won't try to do it real time because that'll be embarrassing. Yeah. <laughs> now, uh, that's the that's the first section uh, on the advection equation. The next section talks about this concept of upwinding and stability. And the main idea here is that you're, uh, there's something called the domain of dependence. So because everything flows in these problems, if there's some disturbance in the solution at one point, it... Uh, you can only have an impact on something that's uh, that's within reach of it, right? So within reach of it means that the, the, you can get there at the speed, C, that's in the equation, whatever the speed is. Um, in physics, we call that the light cone, right? So if something happens enough century, you're not going to find out right away. It takes you have to wait until, uh, you know, 1.4 light years, 1.4 years from now before that disturbance will actually reach you. It can't affect you now. It's fundamental causality, right? So... That's called the domain of dependence. Um, now, if they, if in these uh, advection equations, they're actually one dimensional dependence. And so that's called an upwind or downwind. So if the, if the, uh, if it's a one directional domain of dependence, the upwind direction is the direction in which things can depend on the other thing, right? You can think of it like, I mean, it's kind of bad, but I kind of think of it like when you, if you're upwind of a bad smell, then you can, it can affect you. If you're downwind, you can't, right? So <laughs> that's kind of basically the idea. And the same in the same concept applies to the numerical domain of dependence. This is the region of space that can influence the solution uh, as a term by the numerical method. And it's important that the numerical method at least covers all the correct all the correct domain, right? All the it covers the, the, the numerical domain should cover the exact domain. You can cover more, but it but it has to at least cover that. In other words, like I say here, the numerical me method has to be able to see or smell <laughs> the true domain. Right. If it can't be, if it, the numerical method can't be affected by something that the real solution is affected by, that's clearly not going to work. So that's kind of a very, very uh, a sufficient condition for stability. They, they call the current Friedrichs Louis condition or the CFL condition. And just as a quick example of that, he talks about a very straightforward numerical 
uh, difference method for the advection equation where we just say, okay, we'll take the space derivative, derivative in the most simplest possible way, and we'll use the Euler uh, time discretization method. Uh, again, the most straightforward thing you can do. And then you can see if you do that, it's obvious that the numerical domain of dependence is going to be a triangle that spreads with speed that is h over t, where h is the space grid uh, size and tau, sorry, h over tau, and tau is the time grid size, right? So you must have then that h over tau is greater than c, otherwise you're, you won't, you'll be violating the CFL condition and you're, there's no way that your solution can uh, be stable, right? The good news is after all that discussion, we don't really need to worry about that because good numerical solvers will take care of that for you, right? And that's what this little demonstration is here. He sets up a simple uh, differential equation again, um, using periodic boundary conditions. This, this actually this is exactly the same problem we've already been doing, the simple uh, advection equation. And if you say, okay, what's, what's the time step for 400 grid points? You'll see that the method automatically adaptively figured out 565. But if you use a much finer grid, it'll have to use a much finer time step in order to cover the domain or to, not to bother the CFL. And it does that automatically. So it's something that just takes, that's taken care of automatically. But again, it's like one of these things with all these stability considerations, for me, it's always like, it's something to be aware of. Like I don't, I was not aware of that issue before now I am. So if I run into an error or something that talks about something like this CFL condition, then I'll at least hopefully you have some hope of remembering what it was, right? Yeah. Okay. The next, uh, now, in the past, so far, we've dealt with periodic boundary conditions for the advection equation, but we also talk about posing a boundary condition on a finite domain, but keep in mind that this only has first order in X, so we can only specify one boundary condition. But there's only one correct boundary to place it on. You can't place it on the, uh, it has to be in the upwind boundary because you can't specify it on the downwind because that won't affect anything. Well, it will affect something. It'll cause a big problem because as the uh, disturbance hits there, it'll be trying to force it to be something it's not, right? So you have to specify your boundary based on the upwind boundary, basically. And so he does a demo of this too. I'm not going to reevaluate it, but it's straightforward that the uh, we specify boundary condition on the right-hand side, the upwind for this equation, and it just you know wanders off the screen. <laughs> okay. A little pulse just wanders off the screen. No big deal. If you thought I gave those sections short uh, discussion, wait till you see this section, 12.3, <laughs> we're really going to cruise through it because this is, again, having to do with the stability uh, concerns. Uh, and basically, if you understood the ideas from Chapter 11 for stability, this should be pretty straightforward. If you didn't, then you can just, uh, how do you say, hum along <laughs> for this section because it really requires understanding that the stuff that Andrew discussed last time. Uh, again, the CFL criterion does not give a sufficient condition of stability. Lots of things will satisfy the CFL criteria, even things that don't solve the differential equation. So it's certainly not a sufficient condition for stability. But just glossing over this, um, we again take the semi-discrete point of view, where now we discretize space, but we keep time continuous. And for the advection equation, we can actually just solve this equation because we just have to diagonalize this matrix and we can solve it. And you find out the eigenvalues are all imaginary and they're all bounded uh, by the size, by the grid spacing or by one over H, depending on how you want to look at it. But So they're imaginary and they're bounded. And this tells us right away that since the Euler method, you recall, does not cover any of the imaginary line, that it can't, we can't expect uh, the Euler method to be stable for this type of problem, no matter what the time step is. And on, on the other hand, backward Euler, which it does include the imaginary axis, would be stable uh, no matter what the time step is. May not, give, may not give the right answers, but at least be stable. <laughs> and he makes some closing remarks about this. Uh, uh, one is that many PDEs that have conserved quantities, well, they're, they're, they're involving uh, uh, flow of material, whatever, will have imaginary eigenvalues. So some methods will, ref will be unstable because of this, right? Um, the, the, the text also notes that the, these advection diffusion things where you put in some diffusion will, can be uh, stable because it moves the eigenvalues off the imaginary axis, right? Because remember the imaginary axis, those points, those eigenvalues represent oscillatory solutions, right? And that's what we see with advection equations and with wave equations. But uh, when you move to the left, to the real uh, negative, those represent damping. So those are clearly going to help stabilize things by adding some damping to the uh, 
the equation. So it acts as a stabilizer, he says in the text. Uh, another interesting thing he says is that boundary effects, like the inflow uh, conditions, can have a stabilizing effect because that also moves the eigenvalues in the negative real direction because the decay of the solutions as they move off and out of the domain. So all very interesting stuff for stability. But to me, again, I will say this over and over again, I, I'm not concerned about the fact that I don't fully rock everything that he's talking about in these stability discussions. I don't worry about that because it's not my field to work, worry about developing numerical solvers for differential equations or at all, really. I'm a user of these things, though. So it is useful to know uh, what some of the issues are when you're trying to pick solvers and wondering what happens when why it blew up or whatever. So just throwing your hands up and saying, oh, well, <laughs> doesn't work. It's broken. Now we know some things we can try different methods. We can try adding some damping, these kind of things. Okay, so the last section is uh, the, well, I really am moving along quickly. I was hoping I'd get through this chapter, but I want to get through this chapter. We're going to get plenty of time to, for a cocktail hour to start early. <laughs> so good news for everybody. Uh, so the wave equation is probably one of the most interesting equations that there is because it def defines and uh, describes so many interesting phenomena, right? I mean, everything from guitar strings to uh, quantum mechanics is, uh, involves uh, the wave equation. So it's kind of cool. So this is the typical, this is the one dimensional wave equation. It just says the second derivative respect to time is equal to some speed squared times second derivative with respect to X. Okay, that's the simplest possible wave equation. And one thing I want to note that the, uh, the advection equation we've been learning all so far, you can, re can re rewrite it this way as an operator form where it's a partial derivative with respect to t plus c times a partial derivative with x times u equals zero. I just rewrote this very straightforward, right? Um, way to rewrite that. So that, and if we look at that, we can say hey, the wave equation can be looked at as the same equation, but applying that same operator, well, with a minus sign to that equation. So in some sense, you can think of the wave equation as being the advection equation squared, <laughs> right? But with a minus sign. So if you apply this operator twice like this to u, then you get the wave equation back out again. And this uh, this del operator here just means partial derivative, diff, partial derivative with respect to t versus partial derivative with respect to x. So I thought that was an interesting observation. And because of that form, you can immediately see that, oh, the solutions to this must be of the same form right, some moving shape, except now they can move left and right. It can be plus C and minus C are both solutions to the equation, even though there's a minus C there, right, because minus C squared. Okay, so, uh, but which actual solution you get will depend on the initial conditions. Uh, uh, that, well, the initial condition on, on U tells you what the shape will be, but what happens next, how much of it moves right, how much of it moves left, depends on the initial condition on the derivative of U at t equals zero, derivative you expect to t at t equals zero. So because this is second order, we need two initial conditions on the wave equations. And I hope that's crystal clear because it should be obvious, like even like a, if you think of a guitar string or whatever, um, it could be completely straight, but if, they were in, if they're in motion, right? If it was moving past that point when you start, it'll keep moving and it'll win away, right? Even though it's all zero, the initial condition on the velocity matters as well. So he wants to focus on a particular domain, t greater than zero, and also the x, x span is from zero to one with boundary conditions, the deer slip boundary conditions where the two ends of the string are fixed, which is you know pretty common for wave equation, although periodic boundary conditions are also common. And then the initial conditions are given, like I said, by some function of x at t equals zero, and then the derivative of u is given by some function g of x, also at t equals zero. Derivative with respect to t, right? The time derivative, the velocity, if you will, of the uh, of the string. So proceeding exactly as before, we're going to want to apply the method of lines, but now we have a second order in time, so we have to stop and think. We need to actually make this in a two first order in time equations, and so we just we can start. We, one way to do that is just to use the usual trick where you define some new auxiliary variable y, which is equal to that derivative, right? The velocity u sub t. The partial derivative of u with respect to t. When I say u sub t, hopefully people understand I'm actually saying, I'm reading this, not saying what it really is, which is the partial derivative of u with respect to t. And then we can just rewrite the equation as this way, that the, the derivative of t, u with respect to t is y, and the derivative of y with t is this right-hand side, c squared, um, second derivative of u. But uh, he mentions there's another way to do that, which 
works better for numerical solutions is to instead introduce this new this auxiliary variable z, and we say that the partial root of u with respect to t is equal to z with respect to x, and the partial root of z with respect to t is now equal to c squared times the single derivative of u with respect to x. He calls this the Maxwell form because it's similar to Maxwell's equation in electrodynamics, which also results in wave equations, as you well know, light waves, and where U could be the electric field and Z is the magnetic field. And that's this is kind of like a one-dimensional analog of Maxwell's equation, um, if you will. So, but you don't need to know that. Just, you just test it out. So the exercise 12.4.1 asks us to verify that this actually works, that UT, or UTT, partial derivative of U, second partial derivative of U respect to T is equal to C squared times second partial derivative of U respect to X, which is what we want. It also turns out that the same is true for Z. So both Z and U satisfy the wave equation. And you can verify that in a very straightforward way by just taking the derivative of this first equation, both sides with respect to T, and then take the derivative of the second equation, both sides with respect to X. And you'll see that the, the, the first thing I did there will result in UTT equaling the Z XT, right? And you can swap the order of these two because partial derivative of a function set to x and then partial derivative set to time is the same thing with those order reversed. And then the second equation then when you take derivative of that respect to x yields this piece, which finally gets you where you want to go, right? So that's the exercise done in words, but hopefully it's clear that um, these both satisfy the wave equation, which is actually also true of Maxwell's equation. When, the, in the, when you write down Maxwell's equations uh, in, in vacuum and you and you do the same kind of manipulation that I just did there, you come with two wave equations, one for E and one for B, which are uncoupled. But they're really, uh, yeah. Okay, so that's the equations we're gonna solve. So we're just gonna just twiddle with the initial conditions a little bit. Instead of specifying, so we're gonna continue to specify U at T equals zero, but now instead of specifying U sub partial derivative of U respect to time, we're gonna specify Z at time t equals zero. And I'm going to also call that g. This is not the same g because, right? In fact, it's like the spatial integral of the previous g we had before, but it's uh, it doesn't matter. It's some function, right? So that leads to uh, a system of differential equations, right? Which is now bigger than it was before because it's it's uh, both this u and z are both vectors uh, along the spatial dimension. And this is a big matrix now. And this is another spatial uh, big vector with u and z. And this is, we have not imposed any boundary conditions yet. We just put this together. Uh, but the demo code shows how one can impose those boundary conditions. There's one other little uh, subtlety here, and that is we combine U and Z together into some new vector W. So just big, long concatenate all the U's for all, uh, for all the Z, all the U's for all the X uh, grid points, then to all the Z's for all the grid points. Well, not quite, but close. So what we won't do is we won't concatenate the uh, exterior points of U, only con con concatenate the interior points of U. So the way he does these things, and I think he did the same thing in the chapter 11, is he, first of all, we just do the usual thing, we pick some grid size, 200. Uh, we're gonna use the Chebyshev uh, matrices in this case on the domain uh, minus one to one, right? For 200 grid points. So we get now our X grid points and we get the DX operator um, matrix for those grid points. Now the subtlety here has to do with the, the, the uh, boundaries. So we separate the interior points and the boundary points. So the boundary points are always gonna be zero. We know that. So we wanna make sure that we, we separate that out. So he defines two auxiliary functions. Uh, one that takes the interior points and adds the uh, zeros on the ends, beginning and the end. And one that does the opposite, chops those off, okay? The W vector, which is the U concatenated with the Z, only includes those interior points because the other ones don't move. So we don't need those. We don't want them to move. We don't want them to wiggle around. The Zs are free to wiggle all they want to because we have no, we didn't specify any boundary conditions on Z in this particular problem. You can't because we won't specify two boundary conditions. And we already did. So the rest of this is actually all straightforward. Uh, we define an OD function. Again, we turn this into a system of ordinary differential, a big system of ordinary differential equations. But all we do is we get the W vector, we split it back up into U and Z and extend it, right, add the zeros, uh, then just apply the equation. That's all this is, right, just apply the equation. And we just have to be careful before we pass back out that we chop off those endpoints again, because the OD, OD equation won't care about those, right? The only way the endpoints matter is in this matrix multiplication. That's where they matter. That's where the boundary conditions come into play. 
Otherwise, they don't come into play anymore. So yeah, specify a little bump. Uh, I don't know why this he uses for the initial condition on Z, just the minus of that. I don't know. Um, it, sounds, it was just made it handy, <laughs> right? I don't know what it means. Uh, then, uh, then we combine those. Again, we're going to make sure to chop off the endpoints and shove it into this initial vector W, which is all the OD solver will know about. And we can just solve it from zero to two. Uh, sorry, no, that's, yeah. Uh, and the two here is the speed of light, right? So speed of the waves, <laughs> okay? And so just solve it and you can plot the contour plot like this or more fun is to look at the little uh, animation. And what's happening here is that the initial condition is such that there's there's a, a, there's wave going to the right and there's wave going to the left. That's just whatever resulted from that Z init equal to minus uh, U init did. And it's smaller, why? I don't know, just is. Uh, the next thing he talks about is well, that was for constant speed. We're going to do something more interesting than that. Let's have let's have a the case where the uh, the speed C changes. For example, this could be like sound in different materials, different metals, or light going through glass or something like that. Uh, so we're going to replace C squared with a diagonal matrix where what we'll specify what the speed of speed of uh, the waves are at every, every point, every grid point. So if we're going to do something very simple. I'm just going to have it be one value. Uh, up until midpoint to zero, and then have it change to another value. That's it. Um, it's basically my, it's one for x less than zero, and there's two for x greater than zero. So the only subtlety there is we have to change this into a, a dot product or a dot multiply so that it does all the, the uh, point it, point wise multiplication properly. Otherwise, it's pretty straightforward. And you have this neat little video here. Uh, so what happens is immediately when it hits the boundary, and this is what happens with you know, light hits glass or sound waves through different materials, uh, it reflects off that boundary. Some goes through and some bounces off. And then, of course, it reflects off the, the edges, like it always does, but it starts to get mixed up pretty good. We're, we're done here, though, right? So that's kind of cool. Uh, just so, again, like some part of it reflects and some part of it goes back, but it, it's, uh, it's conserved. The total amount is conserved when it goes through there. Uh, so last thing I will do um, is this equation, exercise 12.4.5. So this is an equation that this says, it's basically the wave equation, except now we've added this damping term, uh, sigma times u. And what this models, uh, electromagne electromagnetism in an imperfect conductor, where sigma is the resistance, essentially, resistance per unit length. And we're going to do the same thing we just did with speed of light or speed of whatever and change it now so the speed's constant, but now we're going to have this varying uh, resistance damping. Um, and well, I'll just plot it here. So this is what it looks like. So to the left of X, it's zero. Everything should be smooth. To the right of X, it's going to damp out. So the wave should, to, should decrease as a function of time. Uh, let's see. Anything to say here? So this is all the same, basically, except now it's sigma that has this structure that I defined. Using, you know, just what they told us to do. Oh, except I divided it by two because I thought that the damping was a little too extreme and it can, it, it damps out right away. <clears throat> um, so yeah, but otherwise everything is the same except, okay, I do pass in now sigma and C both. So I have two parameters now that I pass into the, uh, the function. And, but otherwise I just pull out sigma and do the dot star U right here. So this is the only change. I change the equation this way. I multiply uh, point wise sigma times u and subtract it from uh, derivative of respect to x of z. Otherwise, everything's the same uh, and you can solve it. And this is not very informative, but the video I think is. You can see, bloop, and you can see it just decays as it goes through, keeps decaying as it gets, as it basically being used up by heat in the conductor, as it were. You can also see that it does bounce off that a little bit when the change in conductivity which is something that also happens in uh, real conductors, uh, sometimes called an impedance mismatch. You need to make sure your impedances match well so things don't reflect unnecessarily. <clears throat> anyway, that's basically everything uh, in high speed, maybe hopefully not too high speed <laughs> presentation of the chapter. I think the chapter was relatively straightforward and relatively short, especially if you did like I did and glossed over the um, 
details about the stability issues and just said, okay, I'm going to hum along there and I'll be happy with what I'm seeing <laughs> with respect to that. And I'll know where to look it up later. Yeah. Yeah, interesting. I actually only read the first two sections. It's a really busy time right now. <laughs> but Yeah, I, I hear you. For me too. Nice. I like those the animations. Yeah, it's uh, you know, I basically just copied the code directly out of the uh, the book. It works just, you know. I mean, you have to unhide it, but it's there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> to, to do it. But I don't know, anyone have anything to add? Any other observations about that chapter? I thought it was kind of it was kind of fun. I like seeing I like waves. I like watching them bounce on things and traffic jams. That's kind of fun. Right? Not not too much to add, but I appreciated your <laughs> interpretations. <laughs> <laughs> Andrew, you with us? I'm not sure about his connection. Ah. No, not, not, not much. I, did the, I don't know a lot about the, the topic, you know, like the context. So I think it's more on the, getting the... And You're kind of breaking up for me, Andrew. I'm not, I'm not catching every word. You're breaking up on us, I think. Yeah, me too. But I think I got the gist of it. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I mean, I I have to confess that you know I've done a lot with wave equations over my lifetime. I agree. And I, yeah, I got got cut, uh, unstable internet. <laughs> yeah, now you're, now you're stabilized. You, you, yeah, better. You moved your, move your eigenvalues off the imaginary plane. <laughs> <laughs> Was using an explicit time stepping method. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, saying I've done stuff with wave equations for a long time, I've never really looked at a lot of these things are unfamiliar to me, even. Uh, so I found that a little surprise. I shouldn't say like even, but they were unfamiliar to me, which I found surprising because I've mm -hmm. done a lot of these things before. But I've never looked into the detail. A lot of times I'm just using off-the-shelf solvers that work great. You know? so <laughs> and, but you've uh, but you've you've encountered a lot of these instabilities yourself, or and, and you have a catalog, let's say, or no, not, not, not really, not really, no, because no, people don't know how to do these things, right? If you want to solve like I was doing a lot of sound waves. And there's well-known solvers that work for these things. And you, you do the usual thing, right? You check it by changing the time step and changing the spatial yeah. points. And if the solutions seem really don't change much, you're happy, right? <laughs> Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah, great. Um, so I have the last chapter. And do we want to... Um, just start with that next week, or I mean, if you're uh, if you're prepared to be up, up to you, Torin, because you're you're, you're <laughs> in the book. <laughs> I'm the one that surprised you by having you go a week early, so I'll leave it up to you. Uh, I think it'll be okay. Yeah, right. I think we also maybe only there's also only four sections in that. Yeah, last these last year are nicely short, so so might also be able to. Do it in one. Awesome. Ah, that, that's nice. Sorry, I took I took two. <laughs> no, no, you're fine. <laughs> no, I relied, no, yours was, I think, a longer chapter. And I think, yeah. I introduced a lot of things that were used in my chapter that I could just call back to, which is. Yeah, know, the stiffness, yeah. boundaries. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. It looks like a lot of, well, it's two dimensional. So we're going to, we have a lot of 3D plots coming up. Oh, yeah. How fun that is. <laughs> hopefully and some words i'm familiar with but probably like you were saying not in this context <laughs> yeah around like dirichlet laplace poisson all these statistician names tensors yeah we'll, we'll get through it oh yeah there's some gnarly notation in there <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, well, you know, if you get into it and you think you need an extra week, that's fine too. Or another week to prepare or whatever. Just let us know. Keep us posted. It's just, just us. So, yeah. 
All right. Should be able to get it together. But yeah, I'll let you know at least a day a day ahead. Awesome. Sure. Oh, I should have done the um, thing. Right. Darn it.